Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. In the early days of filming wildlife, as you'll see tonight, researchers had to capture animals in order to observe and learn from them. But that's no longer the case today. Modern technologies such as drones and satellite tracking offer new ways to study animals in their natural habitat with less intrusion from human touch. Wild Kingdom set the gold standard for nature programming and introduced generations of young people to the wonders of the natural world. Fortunately, the successful research that began with our original series helped many animals make a comeback from the threat of extinction. And that's good news for the wild kingdom. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. In the harsh terrain of northernmost Canada, there lives a large mammal well adapted to the rigors of life there. It is the musk ox, a bison-like animal with heavy, dangerous horns, massive humped shoulders, and a dense coat of hair which protects it from the rain, snow, and intense cold of its habitat. These animals have learned to protect themselves well against even the most formidable of natural enemies. When threatened, they quickly move into a tight defensive circle. Standing shoulder to shoulder, they face the enemy, exposing only their huge heads and sharply pointed horns, which they're able to use with deadly skill. Recently, I was invited by the Canadian government to participate in a study of these animals which are so important to the balance of nature in their habitat. Far north of the Arctic Circle, I flew from Resolute Bay, here in the Northwest Territory, to join the scientists here at Melville Island to closely study the movements and habits of the musk oxen. It was an exciting adventure, high above the Arctic Circle. We've come 250 miles from Resolute. And now I can see the ice-flecked sea of the coast of Melville Island below. At this point, the Arctic Circle is over 1,200 miles south of us. Melville Island has no trees and seems barren from this aerial viewpoint. We move inland across the austere landscape, keeping well on our course to the rendezvous. Melville Island is quite large and has low mountains and many small potholes. A course correction by the pilot should take us directly to the Canadian Wildlife Service Research Camp. It is only a matter of minutes until along the shore of a lake, the structures of the research camp come into view. The pilots in northernmost Canada handle their planes with great skill. Because landing strips are not existent here, they must be expert in evaluating the surface below and then trim quickly for safe landing. Since geologists have discovered rich petroleum deposits below the tundra, extensive development looms. So it's imperative to learn what effect that development may have on the ecology in a general way and to the musk oxen in particular, as they are important to the balance of nature here. We're safely down and now I'm ready to begin participating in the musk oxen study being conducted by the scientists here. On hand to greet me is Frank Miller biologist of the Canadian Wildlife Service. He's a leading authority on Arctic ecology. As we enter camp, he explains that his present research deals primarily with the overland movements of musk oxen. His assistant is biologist John Russell. 
John is a good man with telemetry devices and explains to me how the device they're using on the musk oxen sends out a pulsating radio signal which we can monitor at considerable distances. It fits into this collar, which can be seen easily from an aircraft or by ground personnel studying the herds from a distance through binoculars. The scientists use telemetry to closely trace the movements of an entire herd. While the men are getting ready, Frank suggests I look more closely at some of the wildlife nearby their camp. Though the terrain looks harsh and lifeless, there are many animals living here. The first species I detect is a male red phalarope. They're unusual birds in that the male is less colorful than the female and it's he who incubates the eggs and cares for the young. Birds are not the only important wildlife here. A glimpse of white in the distance turns out to be on closer examination a large arctic hare. There's another sitting nearby and this one has obviously just awakened and is still sleepy. An extremely important link in the Arctic food chain are the lemmings. These little rodents fluctuate radically in population levels. Scientists have noted that when lemming populations rise, the birth rate of predatory animals here increases sharply. When lemming populations are low, other wildlife decreases. Sometimes their populations become so great that millions of them blanket the Arctic tundra. On my way back to camp, I observe a most interesting bird, a fine long-tailed Jaeger. This is a graceful predatory seabird. At this season, though, they're nesting on the tundra. At such times, they become quite aggressive and highly protective of their nests. If they feel the nest is threatened, attack will be made by both male and female birds without hesitation and with considerable fearlessness. However, they're not likely to strike me as long as I come no closer. They've wearied of the attack now, and it's time I get back to camp, leaving these triumphant Jaegers behind. Preparation should be all in order now for locating and marking musk oxen. As soon as I returned to camp, we loaded our necessary capture and telemetry equipment into the helicopter, and were ready to look for a herd of musk oxen. The musk oxen herds are found all across Melville Island, and the last herd seen near camp was a few miles to the north. That's where we're headed now. Melville Island has few lakes like this one, and they're usually frozen. Only for the very short summer season are the waters open. Ahead, I can see a small herd of musk oxen running, already startled by our appearance in the silent vastness of Melville Island's sky. 
our pilot quickly moves us into good position directly above and behind the herd. From this vantage point, we can easily pick just the animal we wish to separate from the rest of the herd. We've decided on a full-grown, medium-sized musk ox. Once separated from the others, it will almost certainly stop running. It has stopped. Frank aims the dart gun quickly. Right in the rump. Perfect. Now we'll try to keep our helicopter between the herd of musk oxen and this darted animal. If it's able to get back to the herd, they may form their characteristic defensive grouping to help defend it, and then it could become difficult to drive them away. It's gotten ahead of the helicopter, and now we can't stop it from joining the rest of the herd. There's no other choice now than for us to swing around widely and come back in an effort to scatter them, knowing the darted animal will be left behind. They've moved into their circular defensive posture, and it's part of the group. It's the first time I've actually witnessed this. Whenever confronted by an enemy, whether wolf or man, the musk oxen form a circle, shoulder to shoulder, heads low and dangerous horns pointing outward. In this way, vulnerable calves in the center of the circle will be protected. But our helicopter unnerves them, and they finally break, as we'd hoped, leaving our darted animal behind. For our own safety, we force the herd away from this area. As they move off, the darted animal tries a final time to follow. But it's too grimy. Still, we'll take our time about landing. Musk oxen have bad tempers and can be dangerous. It's altogether possible that if we approached the animal too soon, we would be attacked. Until the musk ox falls, it will not be safe to approach. The drug effects don't last for long, so our timing has to be just right. While Frank and John prepare their equipment, I'll move away from the helicopter to get a clear reading of the collar transmitter on this telemetry receiver. Later, we'll track this animal from the signal sent out by the collar device the biologist will put on it. Right now, they will get an identification tag ready for attaching to the ear of the animal. Then the final rigging of the telemetry device is necessary. Even while they work at this, Frank Miller keeps a close watch on the drug muskox it's still a potential hazard to them. John attaches the wires to the transmitter batteries which fit inside the collar. The signal is beginning to come in now and reception is clear. Though the animal is still on its feet, Frank and John are ready to move. With the skill that comes from long experience, they've timed it exactly right. Now there's no time to lose. As they expected, the musk ox tries to rise and attack them. But Frank Miller gets a firm horn grip to hold it down. It's no easy task, and as an added precaution, Frank ties one forefoot close to the horn, so there's less chance of being gored.
Attaching an air tag is the first step. Now while Frank maintains his grip, John will fit the telemetry collar around the animal's neck. The signal I'm getting is fine, indicating the transmitter is working well and the receiver indicates the pulse coming in perfectly. The color of the collar and its number identifies this animal and the area where it was darted. Now John removes the hypodermic dart from the animal's haunch. They've finished none too soon. The drug is rapidly wearing off. In a moment, the musk ox will be back on its feet. The men hasten to gather up their tools and clear out of the immediate vicinity of the animal. That's my signal to rejoin them. They've done a good job. And with the animal on its feet, we can get airborne again. In the days to come, we'll be able to accurately chart the wanderings of the herd as this animal rejoins them and continues to send us the signal from wherever the herd roams. We continued flying north and soon came upon another herd of musk oxen. This second herd is about 20 miles from the first, and once again our pilot shows his skill in separating a large bull from the rest of the herd. This one is considerably bigger than the first animal we immobilized, and as soon as he stops, Frank will dart him. Direct hit. Now our task is to keep the darted bull from running back to the herd. It will take several minutes for the drug to take effect. This time, we're going to have to be especially careful. The drug doesn't seem to be affecting this bull quickly enough. He's still a real hazard. The timing of these darting operations is cut to a fine level, and while we can't act prematurely, neither can we afford to delay. There's always a certain amount of risk involved in this research work with musk oxen. Still, it's one of the best ways to trace the rangings of the herds so that a determination can be made as to how much space they require and what effect possible oil resource development here might have on the animals. It should be safe to approach now, but it's never wise to underestimate a big bull muskox. That was too close a call. This bull is not reacting well to the drug. It will be safest if we wait inside the helicopter until we're sure that the animal's well immobilized. Frank says he's never before darted a musk ox which resisted the immobilizing drug as long as this one is doing. He's down again. Now we'll have to work more swiftly and yet more cautiously than ever. We'll exercise the same procedure as before, 
but with all of us keeping even more intently on the alert. There could still be trouble from this big bull. It's imperative to pin him down quickly and get the restraining rope attached as fast as possible. Since this bull was slow to succumb to the immobilizing drug, there's a good chance the effects will wear off faster than usual. Normally, only one animal of an entire herd is ear-tagged and fitted with a telemetry collar. Through the signal sent out from the transmitter worn by this animal when it rejoins its herd, it's possible for the scientist to locate the whole group of animals and accurately determine herd movement at any change in herd numbers. Now the two biologists have nearly finished. All that remains is to get the collar aerial pointing straight up so the electronic pulsating signal will come clearly to the telemetry receiver. As soon as I give them the okay, Frank and John prepare to release the animal. The bull is still groggy, but he won't be for long. It wasn't at all an easy job this time, but it was nevertheless a successful operation. In a short time, this big bull muskox will be back with his herd unknowingly sending signals to waiting scientists. Information which is invaluable in helping to preserve the species from being endangered by man, and which can help man to retain the delicate balance of nature here on Melville Island, high above the Arctic Circle. Not a great deal is known about the habits and movements of musk oxen, and so the continuing studies are very important. There's no doubt that these animals are vital to the balance of nature in the far north. With men now becoming interested in utilizing the natural resources here, there is the possibility of destruction to the musk oxen and their habitat. Studies made by the scientists of the Canadian Wildlife Service are determining just how much encroachment can be permitted without disruption of the delicate ecological balance. It's encouraging to see that man is tempering his own expansion into the wilderness with consideration. Instead of merely trying to conquer nature, man is now making concerted effort to live in close harmony with the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay, has presented of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.